Hello, everybody, and welcome to this lecture on hereditary spherocytosis. So since hereditary spherocytosis is a form of anemia, I always include this uh, slide in my anemia lectures. Anemia is a deficiency of RBCs or hemoglobin, as you can see here, and it depends on your sex. Uh, and the symptoms are fatigue, dizziness, lightheadedness. Then once it gets a little worse, you start to see it in the skin in the form of pallor. And then in the later stages, actually shortness of breath because your oxygen binding capacity is that much lower. Moving on in the classic chart that you use to differentiate your anemias, uh, hereditary spherocytosis would fall right under this hemolysis section. It is a normocytic anemia, typically, meaning an MCV mean corpuscular volume of 80 to 100, uh, and it is a hemolytic anemia at its core, so it would fall under this subcategory in the normocytic anemias. We talk about the path of phys. At its core, hereditary spherocytosis is a disease that is based on defective red blood cell membrane and cytoskeleton proteins. Okay, and what this really means is it has decreased membrane flexibility. Those are that's at the core what you need to know for uh, rotations and USMLE. It has defective membrane and cytoskeleton proteins in the RBCs. These are the proteins that can be affected. Um, it's very low chance you'll be asked the specific proteins on step, but it wouldn't hurt to memorize them. These, the spectrin and the anchorin are the biggest two, so I would just, maybe if you can commit those to memory, do so, and if you can do all, of course, that's even better. But anchorin and spectrin are the big two, the most common ones. Um, in addition to this membrane, uh, decreased membrane flexibility, uh, it causes these RBCs to be spherical. Um, so when you look on the PBS, the peripheral blood smear, you'll see more uniformly spherical shaped and little to no central pallor. So for example, if you look here, you have one right here in the middle that's pretty spherical and there's no central pallor. Your normal RBCs are biconcave disc, remember, which gives you some central pallor. Uh, and usually the, this is an autosomal dominant disease. It usually does prevent, uh, present fairly early in life. So the way this really becomes a hemolytic anemia is through splenic sequestration. Uh, you know, normal RBCs, like I said, are biconcave discs, and that allows them, since they're thinner in the center, they're more flexible. They can bend in the vasculature and the capillaries. However, spherocytes, uh, they're perfectly spherical, or essentially perfectly spherical. They can't bend in the capillaries and in the vessels as well as your biconcave disc blood cells. Um, so this actually causes them to get trapped in the splenic vasculature. Um, and after they're trapped in there, the splenic phagocytes will come in um, and do some phagocytosis, causing the hemolysis extravascularly. And I underlined and bolded this because that's something that USMLE will test you on, is knowing that this is an extravascular hemolytic anemia. Emphasis on the extravascular especially. Um, because you get all this buildup of these spherocytes in the spleen, which is what this is right here, this is a, sp this is a, a, a very enlarged spleen, and actually this is a ruptured spleen, you can see. Um, so you would get splenomegaly in this condition, and in rare cases, very rare cases, you can get a rupture. But splenomegaly is the big, big symptom to know. In regards to the rest of the symptoms, uh, because it's a anemia, of course, you have the symptoms of anemia that we touched on, you know, your pallor, your, uh, your lightheadedness, dizziness, those types of things. Um, but remember, since it's a hemolytic anemia, you're going to have jaundice, right? So that's what this guy has on the right here. Um, this is a pretty severe example, but, you know, you start to see it first in the, the whites of the eyes, the sclera of the eyes, the mucous membranes, if you were to see inside the mouth. Those are where you'll see it first, typically. Um, and then it usually starts at, towards the head and then moves down. So the further down the body it is, usually the worse the condition. Um, but this is jaundice. Uh, and that's from, of course, the indirect uh, or the unconjugated bilirubin that builds up because of the hemolysis, right? Splenomegaly, which we discussed on the previous slide. This is a CT scan where you can see here's the liver, here's the spleen. The spleen is a lot bigger than the liver here. Um, it actually goes past down into the pelvis almost, you can see down here. Uh, so that's a huge spleen. 
uh, and an aplastic crisis via parvovirus B19. This is kind of an interesting tidbit that can be tested on USMLE. There's a relationship between uh, hereditary spherocytosis and parvovirus. Um, it's not totally clear what that is, but these people seem to be more susceptible to parvo, and as you know, if you if you studied micro already, parvo uh, can cause an aplastic anemia, an aplastic crisis. So that's a little more pronounced in these people if they were to get parvo and have this side effect of the parvo. Um, and again, because these are less flexible RBCs, they can get stuck easier in the vasculature, so that can lead to a hypercoagulable state. So it's not totally uncommon to get these patients with hereditary spherocytosis come in and be found with a DVT or some microclots. Moving on to the labs and the testing. The basic labs that are going to really you know, be on your CBC and some of the other things you might order. Remember we said it's a normocytic MCV, it's a normocytic anemia, so you have a normal MCV. And here's one, the MCHC which is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. This shows this is part of the CBC, um, but it's seldom really used in practice. But this is one of the, the rare cases where it can be very useful. And this is an increased in spherocytosis. Basically what it means uh, is the ratio of hemoglobin to the size of the RBC. So uh, the, the total volume um, to hemoglobin ratio is going to be altered in spherocytosis, which causes an increased MCHC. So it's a little little trick. If you ever see a normal CIC MCV with an increased MCHC and you're working up an anemia, then this could, could be a hint towards hereditary spherocytosis. Not always, but sometimes it could be a good hint. Like most of your anemias, you have an increased RDW red cell distribution width. Um, because your bone marrow is, for the most part, fine, uh, it's going to be producing more RBCs to try and replace them from the anemia, so you're going to have an increased reticulocyte count. Remember, reticulocytes are immature RBCs. And because it's a hemolytic anemia, you have decreased haptoglobin, because your haptoglobin is binding to the free hemoglobin. So your, your haptoglobin that is measurable is actually decreased. Whenever you see a decreased haptoglobin, you should think hemolytic anemia. And the same with increased LDH, lactate dehydrogenase. This is also a marker for, hemo -like, for hemolysis. Uh, because it's a hemolytic anemia, you get the extra bilirubin. Because remember, in your heme uh, metabolism, it is turned into bilirubin. And so you get the increased total and indirect, especially, bilirubin. And that's what causes your jaundice that we discussed. And of course, we kind of talked about the smear, but check the peripheral smear always. Um, and you can see in this one as well, a lot of spherocytes. And there's a lot with actually essentially no central pallor. So that's, that's your clue for hereditary spherocytosis. And actually, if you look at this PBS, you can tell this person is very, very, very anemic because there's a lot of empty space here. Um, this, this person's hemoglobin is probably around five, maybe less, probably less. So Now the more specialized tests, uh, and the one that you really need to know for USMLE step one is the osmotic fragility test. Um, this test in hereditary spherocytosis will be positive. Uh, another way to put it is that you will have increased uh, osmotic fragility. Okay, and so what this test is, is they put the, the sample RBCs your patient's RBCs, and they mix it with a hypotonic saline. Uh, and in a positive test, somebody with hereditary spherocytosis, those cells will lyse. Uh, and that's because of that increased membrane fragility. So when we're looking here on this graph, it's really easier to read this from right to left, because your y-axis is the percent of lysed RBCs. So uh, here, when you start at the right, both the normal, which is your orange, and the and your patient's hereditary spherocytosis cells, which is the red, start at 0% of them are lysed. And then we, as we decrease this concentration of the saline, look who starts to lyse first. It's the, patient, it's the hereditary spherocytosis. And so your, your, your cells are going to lyse much more rapidly in uh, saline concentrations uh, than the normal. So this is kind of the readout you'd get. I highly doubt you'd actually get this graph, but I'm just trying to put this into context um, to help you understand what this test does. So it tests the membrane fragility. Um, the, the acidified glycerol lysis test is essentially this, a, a different form of the osmotic fragility. Um, 
and it's a little more efficient, really. So you don't really know the, the specifics of that, just that it's very similar to osmotic fragility. And then the last one is the Eosin 5 malamide binding test. This is one of the, in practice, it's one of the more common ones, but in the test, you, I don't think you'd be asked about it, but it is possible. Uh, essentially, it's uh, they put some dye onto the cells, and depending on how much binds to some of these those proteins that we discussed that are that are affected, it'll sh give you a readout of you know the binding capacity of the dye, and there you go. At certain capacities, you can know whether or not you have hereditary spherocytosis. So finally, uh, the treatment. Uh, really, there's no curative treatment per se. It's essentially symptomatic management, um, but that begins and almost ends with the splenectomy, total or partial, generally a total, because it's just going to happen again for the most part if you just do a partial. Um, so do the splenectomy. Another question that they love asking, not just in terms of hereditary spherocytosis, but other, in your micro especially, is remember, once you've had a splenectomy, uh, your patient needs to be vaccinated against uh, all encapsulated bacteria, so that's st especially your your strep pneumo and your meningitis. Okay, so remember that if they ask you a question about a patient with spherocytosis who's getting a splenectomy, what kind of post-op care they need, that's the vaccination. Uh, because this is a hemolytic, you're going to get jaundice and increased bilirubin that can lead to recurrent bouts of uh, gallbladder attacks and cholecystitis, so sometimes a symptomatic cholecystectomy is necessary. Uh, and lastly, because you have increased bone marrow, uh, your bone marrow is working a lot to try and replenish these RBCs. It's going to be using a lot of folate, uh, so just folate supplementation is something that's recommended for these patients as well. And that concludes this lecture on hereditary spherocytosis. Thank you for watching.